What is crack lacking, fellow thermonuclear AFers? I am Damp Valley coming at you with another mailbag episode. Before we get started, the usual reminders, please remember to rate, review, and subscribe to us wherever you're consuming us. Subscribe on YouTube. We've been very stagnant with growth over there, so hit like, comment, help the algorithm love us back. I have no idea why our views are just plummeting and we're not growing as as quickly as we were before, so help us continue to grow there. Uh, if you have not subscribed to us on Apple or Spotify, do that. If you've not written a review or rated us on either one of those platforms, please do that as well. We ask you at the top of every single podcast. I know everyone who listens hasn't done that yet. So if you have done all those things, though, we really do appreciate word of mouth recommendations. Tell people about us. Let us know that you've told people about us. Tag us on Twitter. Shout us out on Twitter. Um, quote something we've said on Twitter or introduce something from a podcast to clip or something we've said or I've said on Twitter. I will retweet, engage it to start any sort of discussion and just continue to help us put our good name out there, I would say. Also, join our Discord. We're not growing as much on there either. Where are all you people? We're heading into the playoffs. This podcast doesn't suck that much. Discord link is in the YouTube and podcast descriptions. And follow us on all the socials. They're on your screen on YouTube. They're also in the um, podcast description as well. At Hardwood Knox on Instagram, on TikTok and Twitter. Excuse me. At Hardwood underscore Knox on Instagram. Uh, also, before we get started, shout out to the Sacramento Kings for ending their 16-year playoff drought. Um, that's just super exciting. I am happy for all my social media Kings fans, friends who now get to cover, who have gotten to cover good basketball and have just covered so much shitty basketball and things happening behind the scenes for so many years. This is great for them. So that's really going to be fun to see the Sacramento Kings enter the playoffs this year. The West playoff bracket is going to be an absolute bloodbath as well. Like that's going to be absolutely absurd. Also throw a quick shout out here too, to my father-in-law totally off topic, but it's my podcast, uh, our podcast, sorry, it's mine and grass podcast. He had open heart surgery, uh, just last week. He's been dealing with some heart episodes. He has a history of heart problems. He's done everything right over the past decade since his last heart attack. Very young. We're all very worried. It's why the podcast volume has been down. It's why I haven't brought on guests when grant isn't, um, really recording with me. Cause I can't really commit to these times. Uh, I was worried I was gonna have to cancel some of our scheduled podcasts on a, on a whim. So shout out to him. I was very worried and stressed uh, and just disengaged. Not sure anyone could tell, but it's always a relief when something like that happens. He's good peeps. And I've known him for 15 years. I was really surprised at how much the news impacted me. Not that I didn't like him, but I was like very affected by it. Um, and I guess that makes sense. You've known him for 15 years. So I am elated that he is now home out of the hospital. There were some complications, which is why this extended. We are hoping it's smooth sailing. From here, the surgeon was very happy, but not really to give an explanation. Just want to give him a shout out because I'm super stoked about that. We can now get into this mailbag about three hours later, uh, three minutes later, actually, though. We'll begin with a question from this is why you should join our discord, by the way. I'm going to try and do more Twitter mailbags. I think that's how people discover us a little bit more. But if you have a question, you could throw it in the YouTube uh, comments aren't really the best way, but you could try YouTube comments, DMs on Twitter. But join our discord, get your questions in there. Uh, we will begin with it's Allen says Jaden McDaniels will be a restricted free agency in 2024 with three presumable max contracts already on the roster and Ant slash cat slash Rudy. How can the wolves expect to match if a team offers him a max contract? Does the choice become keeping him or towns or is this where bird rights let you go over the cap to keep him? I think this is a great question and we can answer part of it first is just, yes, you can go over the cap to keep him like that's what your bird, your bird rights allow you to do. So they don't have to worry in theory about affording uh, Jaden McDaniels, whatever his offer sheet is. And he might even sign an extension, by the way, this summer to where they don't even let him hit restricted free agency. Uh, but and I want to touch on a few things here. Let's first get into the cost of keeping him. And then the fact that he's possibly going to be a star at this point, um, the type of player who might be able to crack the all star conversation. Uh, he's going to be expensive. And like, let's even start there. Forget about the cost of keeping him for a second. This is someone who I haven't gone through all defense teams. Uh, Grant and I are going to do those this week for next week. We're going to record them Friday, lock in our choices then, and that'll go live probably early next week. I think Jane McDaniels will make an all defense team for me. It's going to be so hard. Uh, if he's eligible, I think he might be eligible at guard. So that could help as well. But 
we all know what he can do defensively. He's just defending one through four. He can defend the point of attack. He can go after just the other team's best offensive player, regardless almost of what position that player actually mans. That's actually huge. His offense has just come so far. I think there's still a part of me that wishes when you look at him that he would take more threes, but he's hitting them so efficiently basically since the trade deadlines. It's around February 13th. The roster was in sort of disarray in their first game after the the trade deadlines. I filtered that out. So since that um, February 13th, he is shooting you know 43.5% from three on four attempts per game. I'd like to see that number tick up closer to where it would be like seven or eight attempts per 36 minutes. However, when you look at everything that he is now able to do on the ball, we're talking about someone who has busted out a step back jumper every now and then he's nine of 17 this year on step back jumpers and five of nine from three. That's not a huge sample, but that's still good enough. Um, during this 18 game stretch, he is shooting 58 plus percent on drives while actually taking more drives per game. You can see it in uh, the way that he's attacking to, he's more confident in his handle. His handle is a little bit tighter and more versatile. There can still be some passes or just lost balls that you don't, you know, it, it's just awkward at some points because it's not really his natural state to be slowed down. Let's go run, pick and roll or what let's go after these methodical assaults you want. He wants to make quicker decisions. That's where he's at his best, but he showed the ability to saddle himself with more deliberate decision-making. And that, is huge. Uh, he's hit turnaround jumpers. Uh, like we're talking about somebody who's really going to go to work, go one-on-one -on -one against somebody. That's not maybe an option that you want in crunch time, but he's been able to do that. Uh, he is during this stretch specifically too. We've even seen him hone in on his floater a little bit. And so uh, that's like, or be more efficient on his floater. I shouldn't say hone in. That's just, this is a monstrous development. This is someone who can just do so much more, on offense now. And even look, some of the, do you want him taking these, all these turnaround jumpers? I mean, no, uh, and he's not, again, he's not taking a ton of them, but the fact that that's in his bag, in addition to being able to hit some of these difficult layups, getting to the basket, uh, you maybe like to see him draw more fouls, but that's just going to be inherently tough. When you look at the structure of the wolves offense, I do think having Mike Conley and I'll eat crow there. I was, so I've been wrong about, basically everything Minnesota Timberwolves. I thought the Rudy Gobert trade was a home run. And while things are rounding into form, they are not the regular season juggernaut I expected them to be. And then I eviscerated them for the Mike Conley trade. And it's clear that there was something that it can be measured when you're watching them play and some of the numbers, but there was just something instinctual about that trade that really worked and helped this team. It feels like emotionally based off. If you go back and look at some of the you know recent post game comments or just some of the comments that Chris Finch has made uh, about the connectivity of the roster on offense and not having defensive liability. So I'm just going to eat crow on that one too. Uh, I'm, Mike Conley has helped Jaden McDaniels as well. But when you look at what Jaden McDaniels is now able to do, I mean, during the stretch from a, basically a quarter of the season at this point, 15 and a half points per game and shooting the three ball efficiently and being able to generate more of your own offense. We're not talking about someone who's going to have, you know, let's say 80% of his baskets go unassisted, but look during this stretch, like we've seen 27% roughly of his baskets go unassisted. That is just a huge uptick. It's an uptick previously over what he was doing the season before that. But if you go back and just look at sort of previous seasons, that's going to be a huge, that's by far and away a career high share for him there. I mean, just last season, fewer than 20% of his made baskets were going unassisted. And so to have that element, in addition to what he's able to do on defense, you're looking at someone who you could say, can he be the Wolves is the, the, like two, number 2.5 option on offense. I mean, it's the number three option because you have towns when he's up at, and you have uh, Anthony Edwards and then Mike Conley. I don't know if he fits in there. They try to get Rudy Gobert more post touches. Nas Reed, by the way, just talk about busting out a floor game. He's been incredible too, but he looks like Jaden McDaniels looks like at his peak that he could be the third best player, the third best offensive player on an excellent team. And then the best defensive player on that excellent team. And so that really, when you combine those two, we're talking about someone who could be the second best player on a title contender, or to, you know, if you want to say 2.5 best player, like there's going to be some push and pull there. Maybe, you know, they're sort of vacillating for a position where in this case, it would be between towns and Jane McDaniels, the second overall best player. If we were talking about peak wolves together for the whole season, where you know, towns didn't miss so much time with injury uh, that 
is a monstrous development for Minnesota because of how hamstrung they are asset wise. And I wasn't necessarily critical of this, but I did say it was a gamble that you effectively decided that Jaden McDaniels was worth two first round picks or maybe a little bit more in the Rudy Gobert trade that you included more draft selections because you didn't want to move him. That looks like it was by far and away the right call because I'm not going to set an over under and bet on him making an all-star team, but you can't rule it out at this point. This is year three for Jaden McDaniels. We're talking about someone who is still only 22 years old, won't turn 23 until September, uh, basically the start of next season. There's growth then further growth that could be caked in. Is this someone who's just going to become even better passer we've even seen look he's he's made some strides there too like he just looks more comfortable finding the bigs in the offense now um and the way that he's able to figure out how and and where to operate within the confines of the wolves offensive spacing they do they can do a good job spacing the floor but when you're changing up your lineups where sometimes he's on the floor and there's one big or there's two bigs and we've seen even more of that where Nas reed is a part of those dual big combinations he's just such a smarter more polished offensive player and this is a star sort of hiding in plain sight at this point. I, I still don't think nationally it's been recognized. It's sort of this quaint, cute story. Jane McDaniels might make an all defensive team and look how good he's been for the Timberwolves. The real barometer here, and we'll get into now this question from more of its, of its Allen when he gets his extension. And I, my guess would be he signs an extension that there won't be too much negotiating because the wolves know how much they need to pay. If he goes in and look, we're talking about his max could be about 34.7. I believe based off the current salary cap projections. Um, So it it would kick in in 2024, 2025, and it'd be a 34.8 million, let's say. So we'll set that number there, or it might be a little bit higher than that, depending on where uh, the the cap falls. Is he going to get more than $25 million a year? I had this conversation with uh, uh, someone in the DMs, a listener slash friend of the podcast, and I don't know that I would bet on him getting 25 million, but it definitely wouldn't floor me if we're looking at someone who, gets 27 million. Uh, I, look, it wouldn't even floor me at this point if it's just, look at it this way. If Mikhail Bridges was to hit the open market right now, and I know that McDaniels hasn't shown the um, pull-up jumper that Mikhail Bridges has busted out, and he's also not scoring at the clip because his usage is like Mikhail Bridges in Brooklyn right now, and even Mikhail Bridges on a Suns team that was decimated by injury um, for some points, the opportunity has been different. But if, if Mikhail Bridges hit the open market right now, he would probably get a max contract. And so is it outside the realm of possibility that Jaden McDaniels would get max money in his extension? I'm not ruling it out. That's how good he is. And so if you're the wolves, things start to get expensive. I won't even say awkward, but if you max out Anthony Edwards, which you will in 2024 and 2025, when that deal kicks in, you will have about $128 million committed to Gobert, towns and Edwards. Uh, the sa- the tax that year, the lo- to forget the salary cap, uh, the tax that year is a little over $170 million to be projected. You cake in, let's say, let's go $25 million for Jaden McDaniels. Let's say they get him for $25 million that year on top of the 128 that they already have. That's $153 million committed to five players. So you're already over. Um, you are, I don't even know what the salary cap is for that year. I only have the, the actual tax line written down. So this, the, the salary cap is 140.7. So you've already exceeded that. I, that's what I was going to say, but I didn't want to be wrong. You've exceeded that with your commitment to five players and you, you don't like, I guess for how tenable is that is what you have to ask yourself. How are you fleshing out the rest of the roster? All you're going to have is your mini MLE at that point. Um, you could resign Kyle Anderson, but he'll be older. He is a free agent uh, that same summer as well. Mike Conley's going to be free agent. I'm assuming they're going to guarantee his deal next year. So he'll be a free agent in 2024. He'll be older. You have to be cognizant of this. And I don't think, look, Jaden McDaniels and Anthony Edwards are not the two players that you're trading to make this work. Do I think this comes down to a Towns or McDaniels situation? No, I think it would be more likely to be a Gobert slash McDaniel situation. Gobert will have two years left on his deal at this point at roughly $90 million. How movable is he? I'm not saying they, if the Timberwolves are winning and contending, no, they're not going to move anybody. What will be mission critical though, moving forward is we kind of know what Ampy Edwards ceiling is going to be. We know what Towns ceiling is going to be at this point. Jaden McDaniels is still sort of that unknown mystery box. And so if you can count on him for more offensive creation, kind of in the similar vein of how Kyle Anderson has helped you, you worry less about the aging curves of Anderson, Mike Conley, and then their free agencies to where they, uh, they could leave. 
I I think that's a great problem to have, quite frankly. And th- because as it pertains to McDaniels anyway, maybe you still feel uncomfortable about the Wolves um, having Gobert and Towns and all this money committed to them over $90 million a year starting that season in 24-25. Oh, and hey, by the way, Nas Reed, going to be a free agent this year. You really can't just let him walk. And I think we've just assumed that he'll get non-taxpayer mid-level money, so $11.4 million starting salary or whatever. And the Wolves maybe will be willing to pay him a little bit more. Uh, they have to, in my mind, they they don't have to, but maybe they have to pay, will have to pay a we're not going to play you as many minutes as other teams would tax. Because if you're Nas Reed and the money's the same, yes, you what you're doing in Minnesota is incredible right now. And this is where you got your start. This is where you really became a well-known NBA player at this point. You're going to want a more prominent role. And there will be teams that can offer you a more prominent role than if than the team that has Carl Anthony Towns and Rudy Gobert on its roster. And I think that's going to be sort of an interesting wrinkle to his free agency. Still, even if you have to pay him $12 million a year, let's say, okay, let's go ahead and tack that on to 150 between six players, then you're just into the tax. Like just between Nas Reed, Jane McDaniels, Anthony Edwards, Rudy Gobert, and Carl Anthony Towns. Excuse me, that's only five players. So I was off of my math before. You have just five players and you're just into the tax, basically. That's something that they're going to have to figure out. We'll see if the new ownership group has the the pockets, uh, the stomach financially to continue to float this core. But there's also there's a lot more time before the Anthony Edwards and Jane McDaniels extensions invariably kick in. A lot can happen between now and the start of 24, 25. But I do fully expect both McDaniels and Edwards to be the, the pole stars around which this team is going to build, which is sort of incredible to say internally it does seem like the wolves believed in mcdaniels but i do wonder if they anticipate him being this good i guess the answer would just be yes you've been doing a lot of this stuff all season but to say that mcdaniels is now has he usurped carl anthony towns as a primary building block in minnesota because you're trying to weigh the longer term and towns is more expensive and older i don't think it's unfair to say that's how freaking good uh jaden mcdaniels is at this point and i would just anyone who's not a wolves fan i don't think wolves fans will be shocked if any wolves fan is shocked how how much he gets, I would be shocked by that Wolves fan being shocked, if that makes any sense. Uh, but I do think that there will be people, just fans of other teams, fans of the NBA at large, media members, even executives around the league, will be shocked at how much Shane McDaniels gets, whatever the number is. I'll be prepared to call it a steal if it's if it's less than I think. But even if it's higher than I think, I'm not going to rule out that he just actualizes the value of it because that's how good he has been this season. And I, it's completely, I just... I didn't see this through the first two years of his career where I thought that he could be someone who can shoulder the type of offensive burden and usage that, that we have seen. Let's move on to a, another question here. We've got one from friend of the podcast Bauer. Uh, we have a, it's a question about LaMelo ball. Would LaMelo be more valuable as a trade asset to the Hornets before or after his rookie max extension after means teams are locked into the deal, but that's a lot more salary, which means fewer suitors. Before means they don't have to send as much salary if they don't want and could send one prospect plus a ton of picks. Because I think we can say with absolute certainty that LaMelo would like the request to trade before the ink is dry on his extension. So LaMelo Ball's max extension, if he signs it this summer based off the current cap projection, should be about five years and $202 million or or whatever it is. I think that would be that's a roundabout number there. Uh, I think the Hornets will offer it. I think he will sign it also just because he... It has sort of, first of all, no one turns down these rookie max extensions. Everyone wondered if it was going to be Zion as the first player. Uh, it's not going to be LaMelo. That's just so much money. And also he's had to deal with his own durability issues, especially this season and his lower body. And I think officially you have to look at, okay, what's going on with his brother and his knees and you're LaMelo. You've now dealt with all these ankle and leg injuries yourself that you, you understand the mortality of your career, I guess the, the temporary nature of your career. So I would expect him to sign the extension. Uh, He becomes harder to trade immediately after he signs it for the time being. My guess would be though. So if let's just say he doesn't sign an extension, is he more valuable to Charlotte right now? This is what Bauer's question boils boils down to uh, as a $10.9 million contract next year, headed into restricted free agency or let's say the first year of his new deal when he's making $35 million or whatever it is. I would tend to believe he'd still be more valuable on the extension. Yes, that's a lot of money, but to have the certainty of him being under lock and key for at least three more team-controlled years and maybe four, 
probably not five. I mean, if they broker a five year extension without a player option, sort of what the Grizzlies did with John Morant, that becomes a huge win for the Hornets. That's a huge deal for any team to get their hands on. And I also think when you're dealing with someone of Lamelo's caliber and a team is actually the seller in this situation, it's just so much easier to get adequate value when they're at a higher salary number. Now, maybe LaMelo is different because Charlotte has all these other sort of expendable pieces around him that are making a ton of money. But if you add Gordon Hayward's expiring contract into the fold uh, or ter even Terry Rozier's longer term deal, you're kind of detracting from LaMelo's inbound value. You're using part of his value to get off this money that teams otherwise wouldn't want if LaMelo wasn't included, most likely. Maybe you get other teams involved. There's someone who wants Gordon Hayward's expiring deal. Um, but that being said, I guess it could be simpler if we're talking about you know, a team getting the number two pick and they want LaMelo instead of the, the number two pick. Uh, I guess that that becomes a little bit cleaner because then you can flesh out future pick packages around that number two pick and maybe some smaller salaries. I just think you're in a position to get more uh, out of teams who may not actually suck. And that's the challenge here is if you could say that there are teams that are going to be top five in the lottery, you know, if Portland, uh, I don't know if you'd love the, if anyone would love the LaMelo ball, Damian Lillard pairing, I don't know, like the whole guard stuff in Portland that they keep trying over and over again, whatever. Uh, like there aren't, you know, when you're teams that are, not great unless you're really looking for that instant turnaround. Maybe Orlando, could they see themselves going after LaMelo Ball in that instance? And they're not a team that sucks. They really come on. Uh, okay, then you're going to get some imminent picks that might actually be valuable because they're not great at the moment and they're not necessarily guaranteed to be great if they have LaMelo. Are they willing to give up this year's draft pick and other stuff though? And I think a lot of those teams, even let's use the Thunder as an example, those aren't going to be the teams that go after LaMelo. And so if you're a team going after LaMelo, uh, you're probably a better team. Your immediate picks aren't going to be all that valuable. And so you're going to be mo more interested in the distant uh, picks. But to sort of hedge your bets, you also want you know an immediate return. You can't just even look at the Kyrie Irving trade in Brooklyn. Uh, they got that 2029 first, and that was sort of the, the glamour piece of the deal. But you also got Dorian Finney-Smith and even Spencer Dinwiddie as well, some seconds. You need something or someone to latch on to in the immediate uh with your in in your immediate outlook to say hey this might not be the centerpiece it's we wanted these distant first round picks in 2028 and 2030 but we also have player x coming in um teams that are good are going to be willing to give up more of their primo assets than teams that aren't good or are guaranteed to be good after the fact there are certain instances again where that might be different the kings and the Pacers that trade with Halliburton and Sabonis is sort of a, a unique circumstance where is that laying around out there? Uh, the Hornets actually suck way more than the Kings did when they made the Halliburton trade though, because if you trade LaMelo, that is your directional star. I know PJ Washington's had a hell of a year, but if you're trading LaMelo, that's it. That's on. It's over with uh, you. You're starting from square one. I guess maybe you could technically have Victor uh, Wembenyama, depending on where your draft pick falls this year. So I think, to the Hornets because of the teams that will be most interested in him. You want him to be on that extension because the assets that you're going to get, uh, they're going to be more interested in him and have, I guess, salaries that need to be moved that are going to be easier to match when you're not dealing with LaMelo's lower number. And yes, I recognize that it's so much money. We just have to get used to these, these bigger numbers. That's my gut feeling. Um, mostly because I think the only way that he's not more valuable on his extensions, if you're, you know, you moved him this summer and you're getting like, I don't even know, like the number two pick. And I don't even know if a team would trade the opportunity to draft Scooter Brandon Miller for LaMelo, a team that's going to be in that position is my point. Like, just look at the teams that'll be eligible um, for, or should be eligible for that pick or are most likely to have that pick. But that is kind of a fascinating and not kind of, it was a fascinating question. Good question. Bauer uh, JT Alexander as might be a bit late, but where would you have Jalen Williams in a 2022 uh, redraft? We already, we did this exercise, Grant and I, a few days ago, and we had him number two. Uh, JT Alexander specifically asked, does he get picked before Keegan Murray? I absolutely think he still does get picked before Keegan Murray. I think we can get too caught up in what's immediately happening. And when you look at Jalen Williams, that's someone who could be, 
it's more than a three and D when you look at the way he, that he could bring the ball up the court and just gets going downhill and wants to play so fast. I don't know that I necessarily see the slow down, more methodical creation from him where he wanted him to run the offense or hit a bunch of just pull up jumpers at some point to make defenses work at every level, not just at the basket or when they're in rotation. I don't see the outline of that player. Just it's, it's year one. So maybe he becomes that player. Uh, you can see that in Jaden Sharp. You can see that in Jaden Ivey. So maybe you're more likely to favor those picks still, and I think that's fine. Excuse me as I sneeze. I think the other thing to consider here would be Chet Holmgren. I I think some people would pick Chet Holmgren over Jalen Williams still, and I can't, like, I'm not going to argue against Chet Holmgren's upside. He just hasn't played this year, and we're working off this sample from uh, – Jalen Williams, where it's easier to say, oh, look how look how really good, ridiculously good that he's been. And it makes us sort of forget about Chet because we haven't seen Chet. Uh, so but if I had to if we're looking at the candidates of. Who might actually be able to still be picked in front of him, the list is pretty short, I guess. Would you still consider one of the big questions would be, do you still consider taking uh, Jabari uh, Smith Jr. instead of instead of him? I probably wouldn't at this point, but so we have Chet Holmgren and Paolo Bencaro, of course, those players, I think you could argue that you would take in front of him. And I definitely would take Paolo in front of him. Uh, after that, I think Jane Ivey and Shaden Sharp still have a case. Jeremy. So no Dyson Daniels. No. And that's just, that's really it here. You're not going to go with any one of the bigs or, or Tari Eason. I still don't look Keegan Murray being a little bit on the older side and just not having the, the defensive chops that Williams does. Uh, same thing with Benedict Matherin, except for the not being older. There might be a lot more offensive self-creation there, but I like the two-way balance that you're going to get from Jalen Williams more. So it's really Holmgren, Ivy, and Sharp, or the and Ben Caro are the only names that I would consider taking in front of Jalen Williams at this point. As of right now, I, I do think he would go number two. At lowest, I think he would go is actually three. Let's account for, oh, teams still want to invest in the upside of Sharp or Ivy or Holmgren. I don't think it's going to be a case of uh, all of them would be taken in front of him. That's a fascinating question. It'll be even more fascinating to kind of revisit this a year from now when we've had even a larger sample uh, from these rookies. Another question from It's Allen asks, Woj or Shams? Uh, this is a tough one. I I don't I, I know people get on Shams for how he kind of portrays press releases from teams where he's not retweeting or quote tweeting them or reporting them as the team announced. It kind of makes it seem like he has sources. And then also he's had some like cringy pieces published where he's clearly doing a solid for the player and their representation. Woj has kind of done the same stuff. They're all beholden to their sources. This is t based off stories. I've heard about how Woj has impacted certain staffing issues behind the scenes. I think I would go with Shams here. Just it seems like maybe he would be. I don't want to say he'd be. I don't know. I this is such a tough question when it comes to just strictly their reporting. I kind of like that you will get more. Like there's the the case to be made for maybe not case, but there will be instances of Woj kind of showing a personality on Twitter where you don't get that from Shams. I also appreciate that Woj isn't going to have as many. Uh, you know, redrafts of his tweets. It feels like a lot of Sham Shams reports. I'll get the notification on my phone and I'll get another one because he had to delete it uh, to correct something, a spelling error or an information error that was in there. So maybe I do lean Woj as a reporter and Twitter user. If it was, let's grab a beer type of thing. I hate beer. So let's grab a vodka and pink lemonade. I think it might be Shams. I, I don't know. That's a really tough question, though. That's that's really that's more of a thinker than I think it's Alan probably wanted this to be or intended it to be. Unbiased Pistons fan asks, how long before you we can call, reasonably call player uh, the B word referring to bust? Is it one contract? Uh, is that too soon? One year? What is it? I do, I obviously don't have the concrete answer to this question. I think it's fair to say one, there's two different forms of bus because there's going to be players who I guess never actualize their potential relative to their draft status. And so let's use, uh, let's use Marco Fultz as an example. Clearly shouldn't have been 
the number one pick, but he's turned to a really solid NBA player. So is he a bust as a number one pick? Sure. But as an NBA player, no. So you kind of have to reconfigure your expectations. Maybe that's the better way to frame this question. Not better. Another way. So I don't want to insult, uh, what is a good question from unbiased Pistons fan? I would say before we have to reset expectations or call a player a bust, I typically throw not the first two years out the window, but if they're bad first two years, like I'm not going to lose faith in almost anybody after year three, that feels like it. I don't think it needs to be one full contract. And so look, sometimes team make this, sometimes teams make this decision before one full contract is up where you see them decline a third year option or a fourth year team option. Um, so the players aren't even finishing out the life of what's really supposed to be, in essence, a four-year contract that they're signing at the rookie scale. And also, it does feel like there would be a range at which you can no longer be considered a bust because everything is just such a dice roll. I don't know what selection that is, maybe outside the lottery, uh, maybe even at some point inside the lottery. But when you're looking at tippy top picks, I would say that uh, you know after three years is where it would be fair to start enter obtaining that, especially if it's, they haven't really shown anything. Uh, it gets a little bit dicier if, if they're mostly health related issues. Uh, but I do think three years, it doesn't need to be a full contract for me, but it would be three years before I call a player a bust. And if we're talking, I think you can go a little bit sooner though. I'm talking about my two year rule, but it, it can become pretty clear early on where it's like a year and a half in, Oh, this guy is never going to live up to the superstar billing. That's supposed to be incumbent of a number one or number two, or number three pick, maybe. And so it might be a little bit shorter to where I, I would frame it this way, then. It doesn't take as much time, let's say a year and a half, a season and a half, maybe two, to know, well, we need to recalibrate our expectations for where this, for what this player can be relative to where they were drafted uh, versus I think you give it a full three years before it's, oh, I'm just, I'm out on this guy. I don't think he's ever going to amount to a valuable NBA uh, player. That's a, I would be curious what everyone else says. So get in our discord and let me know how long before you would call an NBA player a bust. This next question comes from muckle. I need some honest feedback on Evan Mobley making the all defensive team in my extremely biased opinion. He should be a lock and the only debate should be over defensive player of the year. He's played almost 1000 more minutes than triple J that's 28 games when using Mobley's minutes per game and has only committed a handful more fouls. He's elite at defending on the perimeter and down low. He's a beast with almost no national attention. I'm afraid he's going to get overlooked and this will turn out like the rookie of the year race last year. Yes. I'm still bitter about that. I, like I said before, I have not gone through my all defense teams. Evan Mobley will certainly be on the, uh, will certainly be on the, sh the sh it's, maybe it's a long list for me. I don't even know how you're going to narrow down um, forwards, front line guys, when you're looking at uh, making picks for all defense this year. That just feels like it's going to be absolute hellfire to do. Uh, so uh, to say that he's a lock, I, like I would really need to go through it, but just like kind of consider some of the, if he's going to be eligible in the same tier as, Jane McDaniels, for instance, what does Herb Jones qualify as? I know that he gets announced as a shooting guard for the Pelicans, but he could log most of his time all over the place. Uh, you have Giannis Antetokounmpo is going to be in there. And so there's only like going to a limited number of spots. There's only two all defense teams to fill up. Excuse me. Uh, Jared Jackson Jr. Bam Adebayo are going to be in like looped into that as well. I so I'm hesitant to call him a lock. I do find it interesting though. And there is look when you watch it, there is more to me of a ubiquity to how Jaron Jackson Jr. is defending sort of this like controlled chaos that can also be ungoverned chaos when you look at the amount of foul trouble he gets in. So I'm not saying that Evan Mobley shouldn't be in the defensive player of the year conversation. I am a little bit surprised that he's not getting more buzz where it's sort of been determined that. The two names, or maybe even three names, because I still think Bam Adebayo has been really good, but looking at Bam, Evan Mobley, and then even Draymond Green, I know the Warriors defense hasn't been great, but Green has by and large been great. I'm just surprised that those names haven't been mentioned as much as we've seen. I've seen some Giannis. There's definitely Brooke Lopez. He might even be the betting favorite as of right now. And then Jaron Jackson Jr. Uh, the minutes play discrepancy, I don't know how to reconcile that. Jaron Jackson Jr. would be like one of the third lowest minutes per game winners of defensive player of the year the NBA has ever seen if he does get the, the award. Uh, I do feel like, yes, Evan, it's sort of flown under the radar too. Like the Cavs are one of the two teams that rank in the top seven of both offense and defense. And the other teams, the Boston Celtics who are kind of just fading a little bit at the moment, Mobley specifically, 
not all of the catch all metrics love him. And so I do think that sort of hurts. You look at defensive estimated plus minus uh, doesn't seem to love him, but he ranks second in LeBron defensive point saved. Uh, Nicholas Claxton ranks number one in that category. These metrics are all flawed. Nicole Jokic is in like the top 10 of LeBron defensive point saved. Uh, but like just looking at everything else that Mobley does, he's fourth in total shots contested at the rim. He is in the top 10 of blocks, even though he's not considered the traditional shot blocker. Uh, he contests 44.1% of the other team's shots at the rim when he's on the floor. That's actually a higher number than what Jaron Jackson Jr. is con contesting. And I think a lot of that has to do with the way these teams defend. Jaron Jackson Jr. spent a lot of time on the floor with uh, a Brandon Clark or a Steven Adams. Not anymore. Obviously, both those guys are, are injured. Jaron Jackson Jr.'s actual rim protection numbers are better, though. He's more elite in that area. He's saving more points per 75 possessions at the rim. Uh, but like, if we go like it, yes, triple J, it does feel like there's more of a ubiquity to him where he can fly around more places just on one given possession where it feels like Mobley can do the same, but is also King on, uh, King in on what would be tough singular assignments. Like he's responsible for so much, but when Jared Allen is on the floor, his role changes a little bit at the same time, he takes on harder matchups overall. Um, the Cavs defense is still in the 87th percentile when he's playing without Allen. It's still in the 76th percentile when you play without Allen and have both your guards on the court in Garland and Mitchell. That's absolutely huge. He's gotten better as sort of just this stand-up rim protector. Uh, I could probably... I, I Mobley is the better on-ball defender. I would trust Jaron Jackson Jr. in the post more. He's definitely... I don't know if I mentioned this already. He's definitely going to be better in the passing lanes. I do think it comes down to what you value. And when you look at just straight up shot deterrence. I do feel like because he's a little bit stronger and also because of how many of his, his, I don't even want to say his blocks, but his contests are coming as not even the primary line of defense. Uh, there's more of a fear that Jaron Jackson jr. Instills, but you watch what Evan Mobley does on the defensive end. And I think that you can say his overall role, it covers a larger scope might be the best way to frame that for me. I do wonder are voters or media members or just fans of the game sort of diminishing his contributions because he plays with, yeah, you look at the perimeter defense and it could be spotty. Although I think Karis LeVert's done a pretty good job of fighting this year when he's playing the three, uh, but you have Jared Allen next to you, who is someone who might have sort of his own all defense case. If he was going to have enough minutes played uh, relative to some of the other candidates does that detract from him at all where yeah okay jaron jackson jr has dylan brooks uh but he has you know even steven adams he's very valuable from a rebounding perspective and being a big body he's not some excellent defender uh, and also jaron jackson jr the grizzlies defense do whatever split you want it's going to be elite more elite than cleveland's when jaron jackson jr is on the floor with adams without adams with brooks without brooks at power forward at center it doesn't it doesn't really seem to fucking matter when you go through the through the lineup splits and I think it's, I think the bigger difference to me would just be the statistical dominance that Jaron Jackson Jr. has showed as a rim protector and as someone who's going to just get more of those. Uh, I, I'm not, I want to make this clear. I don't think this is a product of purely counting stats, but as someone who's third in blocks per game while being what is he even in the top 150 of minutes played? This season's 156 in minutes played right now. That's kind of incredible. And Evan Mobley, yes, he's played substantially more, but isn't going to have that same erasure. Evan Mobley is sixth in total minutes played this season, by the way. But I do think, look, being on the court for that long, I, I think that has to matter as well. And so uh, if you told me that, uh, if you told me that Evan Mobley was the defensive player of the year, that's who you're voting for, I can't push back against it. And so to, what I hope is answer Muckle's question. Yes, I think he's underrated in the discussion. If I had to guess whether he's a lock for all defense, I don't know. I, I, just based off my own thoughts, I will call him a lock because I think he'll make uh, my all defense team. I think he made my all defense team last year. So yes, he's a lock for all defense. I think the case for defensive player of the year is arguable, but I will agree that it feels weird that Evan Mobley isn't mentioned more routinely as a candidate. And I can't pin the exact reason why, because I don't think the gap between what he's doing and Jaron Jackson Jr. is doing is that large. If it exists at all, the only thing I can really come up with is does so much of what Mobley did, especially earlier on this season, get overshadowed by the fact that, Oh, it's him and Jared Allen together. And it just feels like a success by committee instance. And Jaron Jackson Jr. Came back 
midseason after being out with an injury and just totally not reinvented the Grizzlies defense, but they weren't forcing as many turnovers without him. And the defensive statistics were all over the place. They weren't even a great defensive team to start the year. He comes back and they're all of a sudden just the best defensive player, uh, best defensive team in the league. I think that I don't want to call it a narrative, but that turn of events, that development has helped his case. And I also, finally, I'll say when it comes to all defense, I definitely think you need to weigh um, every factor, but could it be the reverse of uh, MVP where it feels like we're so caught up in durability as one of the elements for the MVP award. But when it's defensive player of the year, if you're going for the vote of Jaron Jackson jr, it's not necessarily a vote for availability or staying on the court as much as was this just the most outstanding defensive player, almost bar none with the minutes. And that's not to say that uh, Jaron Jackson jr has played a good, it'll be, should be over 1800 minutes by the end of the season. Is that just going to be, enough and so it feels like almost we would be viewing defensive player of the year in the vein of all nba where i think people are a little bit more flexible with the sample sizes and more inclined to say well yeah kevin durant he can't finish top five on the mvp ballot but he could certainly make second team all nba with the minutes that he played i'm not saying he will but i think that there will be that type of logic and so are we ascribing a similar sentiment to the defensive player of the year conversation that being said i absolutely think evan mobley is capable of winning the award if i had to guess on my defensive player of the year ballot uh because of how much people favor just the, the straight up rim protection, when you're talking about the volume of the shots contested, and in addition to the rim deterrence, uh, which I do think that bigs like Brooke Lopez, maybe even Giannis, and of course, Jaron Jackson Jr. are going to be better, more frequent deterrence too, because of the positions and roles they play than an Evan Mobley. That goes into it. I think Mobley has a strong case, though, to be in the top three of the, the ballot that people are going to fill out. I don't think he'll crack the top three of most ballots. I agree with you there, Muckle. Uh, but I do, I do, I also agree that I think he belongs in the conversation has not been given enough credence in that, even if he is not your, your ultimate pick. Uh, hopefully I did that question justice muckle. Cause I know that I know you hate the Cavs and aren't a Cavs fan at all, but that will do it for this mailbag. I hope you all enjoyed it. It was a long one. And until next time, please remember to rate, review, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Remember to check us out at Apple, Spotify, leave ratings and reviews, subscribe, like, comment on Twitter, help the algorithm love us back. We appreciate shout outs. Let people know about us. Word of mouth recommendations, uh, retweet our promos. Again, like I said, quote us or something we said on the pod or compliment us or whatever on, on Twitter. We appreciate it all. And until next time, and as always, I leave the shout out to the one, the only, the indelible Frank Neil Aquina. And also I leave you with my apologies and Grant's apologies to Jared Allen. 